Arrakis, Dune, Book Club, Chapter 4, Wholesome Howard Highlights Hazards, Hellic Harm or Helpful, Welcome to Peppers and Glowworms, a channel dedicated to hot chili peppers and coldly glowing glowworms. <coughs> In Chapter 4 we are introduced to two new characters. The first one is Thuthia Howard, the old mentored master of assassins who, uh, as it is said in the little quote at the beginning of the chapter, uh, struck fear even into the heart of the Padishah Emperor. And um, he is described in the chapter, not, not a whole lot, uh, but a little bit. Um, he is introduced as uh, feeling old and tired and storm-leathered. Not weathered, but leathered. Uh, so I guess his skin looks kind of leathery. Uh, his left leg is said to be aching from a slash uh, that he received in the service of the old duke. And it is said he had, that he has served the Atreides for three generations now. Uh, he's also described as a grizzled old man. And his eyes are... Two pools of alertness in a dark and deeply seamed face. And that's uh, already all there is as a, in terms of a physical description. But uh, one other thing that is kind of striking in this chapter, he seems to be quite prejudiced against the Bene Gesserit. He always refers to them uh, kind of mockingly and witch mother, um, uh, Paul's mother and uh, her precious school, uh, things like that, and other parts, he's kind of um, making fun of the Bene Gesserit, which is kind of foreshadowing uh, to the things that he does in relation to Jessica later, or things that he assumes, but that we will see uh, later in the book. So yeah, that's uh, good old Thuthia Howard. And Gurney Halleck uh, appears also for the first time in this chapter. And uh, well, in the movies, of course, it's always uh, Hollywood ugly. Uh, <laughs> um, but in this case, he's supposed to be really ugly. Um, he's described as an ugly lump of a man. And uh, Paul watched the rolling ugly man set himself back in motion, for example, and he has a prominent scar uh, on his jawline, or uh, along his jawline, an inkvine scar. It is not quite described what inkvine is. I'm not sure if it is even at all described in the uh, classic uh, Dune novels, uh, but it was certainly um, described in more detail in those uh, prequel novels by the son of Frank Herbert and another author. It's beet colored and that's also something that is said and there's a story attached to it um, that he received it uh, by the beast rabban himself in an harkonnen slave pit on gidi prime and paul assumes that the making of the scar had been accompanied by quite a lot of pain and maybe even as intense as the pain that he received at the hands of the old reverend mother gaius helen mohiam yeah, and while Thuthia Howard is uh, somewhat prejudiced against the Bene Gesserit, it is clear that Gurney Halleck harbors uh, quite the hate for the Harkonnens. He recalls at the end of the chapter, he recalls his younger sister, and that she is dead now, and uh, appears to have died in a pleasure house for Harkonnen troops, which cannot be a nice way to go. So yeah, he really seems to hate the Harkonnens, and of course he sings in the chapter as he is the troubadour warrior um, as he's called and there was also earlier in the book a little quote from a poem of him but now he's singing a kind of a lute little uh, song but i will not uh, try to sing right here right now there's also uh, no hints to the melody or anything, uh, perhaps uh, nowadays there um, are maybe some AIs that could uh, turn this easily into some kind of song, but uh, I will not try this here. Lucky you. 
Jessica and the Reverend Mother Gaius Helmo here appear sort of in a flashback when uh, Paul discusses his experiences um, during or shortly after his humanity test, but they are not uh, appearing for real uh, in this chapter. Yeah, what happens in this chapter is that Paul has a talk with Thuthia about uh, the imminent departure from Caledon and the dangers of Arrakis, and as I mentioned, some things that happened shortly after the humanity test, a little exchange that he had mostly with the Reverend Mother Gaius Helmo here, and a little bit with his mother, but he finds that he cannot go into much detail because it appears that, quote, she put some kind of hold over me, end quote. So he seems to have been mentally conditioned to have some kind of blockage against uh, talking about what happened there at this humanity test. And then there, um, later when Thulthia has left and Gurney Halleck appears, there's quite a lot of amusing bickering between uh, Paul and Gurney, but not um, like the bickering that happened between Piter and the Baron earlier. It is uh, much more friendly, kind of like these, uh, like jokingly insulting each other uh, between very good friends. Sounds harsh to outsiders, but it is clear that there's really a, a deep fondness and liking uh, between between those two. And they are, um, yeah, good good friends, you could say. Yeah, and uh, as I mentioned, Gurney sings a little bit between the bickering, and then there's uh, a little bit of shield practice, uh, shield fighting practice, where. Paul and Gurney fight, and it starts kind of jokingly, as I uh, implied already, but then it turns uh, serious for a moment, and there's this whole thing about mood, um, that mood is not, um, you have to fight uh, when you have to fight, regardless of mood, and um, Gurney gets uh, so serious that Paul thinks for a moment uh, that there might be a betrayal, and uh, Gurney would really try to harm or kill him, maybe, but of course that's not the case. And then uh, at the end there's some more shield fighting practice, but this time using a fighting dummy that is controlled by Gurney. Some more notable parts of the chapter that I want to mention in more detail are uh, a little bit of an analogy between uh, Arrakis and Salusa Secundus, which is kind of important for the overall plot and plotting of the uh, people in the book, actually, or the plans within plans. Paul mentions that his father told him about Salusa Secundus. It sounded a lot like Arrakis to him. Maybe not as bad, but very much like it. He seems to guess something about it, and they discuss um, the Fremen on Arrakis and whether they may be helpful for them, maybe whether they might be joining them in their fight. Yeah, that's uh, something that's in the background there. A harsh planet that produces uh, good warriors. It's not, not mentioned really directly, but that's what's in the background there. And that's kind of important for the whole plot and plotting. But it's not uh, mentioned or discussed in more detail, just a little hint. And you can see that um, Paul really seems to be very brilliant in comparison to other persons in the book, because later in the book the Baron himself is quite slow to uh, realize this thing that Paul seems to immediately uh, grip when he uh, hears about Salusa Secundus, so he's really a smart little one. And a funny little thing, at the end of the chapter Gurney mentions an expression that his mother had used, it is, if wishes were fishes, we'd all cast nets. And he muses that uh, it is an odd expression, now that they are embarking to a planet that has never known seas or fishes. But of course, uh, well, he can know this, I guess, but uh, later in the original Dune book series it is implied that uh, Arrakis had not always been a desert planet. That was in fact um, kind of terraformed, but not uh, really uh, desert formed by the ecological uh, processes regarding the uh, reproductive cycle of the sandworms. But uh, of course Gurney is not a planetologist or ecologist, and I think it's not, uh, even among those, it is not common knowledge that Arrakis was not always a desert planet. So maybe there were fishes on Arrakis before.
the actual quote um, for this chapter. Uh, so not the little quote from the works of Princess Irulan at the beginning. Kind of hard to decide. It's all about these uh, about the imminent departure from Caladan to Arrakis and the dangers involved with it and, and some precautions that they have to take. But I decided for a little remark, half jokingly by Paul to Ruthie Howard, it is don't sit with your back to any doors, Paul said. And before there, before that, uh, Fufir was admonishing him, or he didn't even, ha even have to. Paul uh, um, realized it uh, himself before that he was uh, sitting with us back to the door. And uh, Fufir doesn't like that, because uh, you should always uh, have your eyes on the door where the enemies might appear, even if you think you can recognize who's coming by the sound of their approach because uh, those sounds could be imitated. Yeah. Uh, another of my little segments uh, from other memory, some common tropes from fantasy or mostly sci-fi. Mm. What struck me the most, uh, of course, are the personal shields, which are introduced in this chapter. And they have this peculiar little mechanism that they uh, keep away uh, attacks with high kinetic energy, so to speak, but slow moving uh, attacks uh, slip through the shield. And that's how the whole um, fighting style of this era is, um, or uh, the whole close combat fighting style of this era is uh, designed. As Paul himself says uh, mockingly, this doltish Gurney Halleck has forgotten the first lesson for a fighting man armed and shielded. It is that in shield fighting one moves fast on defense and slow on attack. That's basically it. The mechanism of the shields, well, it is a little belt that you buckle around your waist. And when you push the button, uh, you feel a crinkled skin tingling on your forehead, on, on your back. And uh, the sounds uh, from the outside seem uh, kind of muffled uh, with a shield filtered flatness. And when shields touch each other during the fight, um, there's also a, an electric tingling of the contact along the skin um, can be felt. And it appears that uh, they are not uh, penetrable uh, by air very much at least, uh, because it is said that the air within their shield bubbles uh, grew stale uh, from the demands and that the slow interchange along barrier edges uh, cannot replenish that. And with each new shield contact, uh, the smell of ozone is growing stronger. Yeah, and of course, um, this kind of personal shields appears a whole lot in sci-fi and I guess also fantasy. Um, the first thing that came to my mind were the personal shields of the Goa'uld uh, used in the Stargate series franchise, not the original uh, movie. Or I guess there were also personal shields, I'm not quite sure right now. Uh, in the series uh, SG-1 at least there the shields worked kind of like this, um, with slow moving objects or low energy objects uh, going through the shield, at least in the beginning, uh, as I think it was kind of contradicted later when one of the main minis, uh, the uh, system lord Apophis was, uh, I think in this uh, really, really last moments when he finally died, there were replicators crawling all over his personal shield, which was kind of contradictory because I think this would be uh, slow moving and it would penetrate the shield but um, maybe he cranked it up or whatever. Hand wave here, hand wave there, um, but it is a very common trope. And I think in the new um, Dune adaptation to the big screen they finally made the shields work the best for the audience with a little visual indicator whenever, whenever the shield blocked an attack I think it would light up blue. When the shield was penetrated, it was lighting up red, like blood. That made it more easy to follow, especially if you compare it with the hilarious uh, shield fighting sequence in the David Lynch adaptation with those little blocks that appeared. Uh, they looked like uh, the characters from uh, today's Minecraft, <laughs> I think, with all the blocky edges. Kind of funny and a bit 
Hammy. Um, but yeah, um, well adapted in the latest movie, I think. Moving on to uh, the next segment, uh, Mary Sue Paul, where I list all the titles, names, achievements and abilities of uh, Paul Atreides. Mm. Not really much new, but you can say that uh, he was trained by his father's finest fighters and strategists. That's something, I guess. Now, moving on to worm signs. Uh, were there any mentions of the great sandworms of Dune by name in this chapter? Let's have a closer look. <laughs> Uh oh. We have a worm sign. So, that means I get to consume a little chili pepper. I have been to a local hot shop, a real shop where you can walk in, which is a kind of rare for Germany at least. I think it's more common in the USA. Um, And I've gotten some small little Carolina Reapers. I uh, li deliberately picked uh, the smallest one that I could find, but uh, one that was somewhat small but had a little stinger like this. But I think I'll just consume the small one. It's almost a similar size to the uh, specimen number two of the Ahi Charipa. F2, a little, bit, a little bit bigger, but of course that's uh, the exception on the plant that they are this small. But as I mentioned, I like them. I like them small. So I have consumed the usual amount of oat and fatty milk and other stuff, so my belly is well filled. Uh, now, let's just shut up and eat it. Bless the Maker and his water. Bless his coming and his going. May his passing cleanse the world. Oh, smells good. Mm. Okay. Hmm. 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 Very slow heat build up. Fruity, fruity, slightly acidic. Okay. Oh, damn it, I never get any calls, but now right in the middle of this uh, little taste test. But, uh, I was able to do this, uh, uh, to answer the phone call quite normally, so mm, not that much heat. It still is firing a little bit where I shoot on it, but I think I can confidently say the specimen 2 of my Ahi Charipa uh, F2 was hotter, yes, but that happens sometimes, especially when those <coughs> yeah, super hot peppers are grown in, uh, without, um, outside of the season and under suboptimal uh, growing conditions. And maybe in this case the small one wasn't uh, not very, was not very uh, representative. Um, it's starting to fire up a bit more in my stomach, but since I 
prepared very well and ate a lot of oats to build a protective covering on my inside so I don't expect much trouble. Yeah, I was aiming high for the Carolina Reaper on this occasion for the first worm sign but mm, uh, a low start so uh, there's still room to build to build it all up and I'm not gonna consume this one now additionally it was the only one worm sign after all <laughs> okay <sighs> I hope we will have some more interesting worm signs in the rest of the book.